it's certainly true that viruses spread a lot less well in the summer than they do in the winter time. And there are a number of reasons for this. The simplest one and the most effective intervention is that when it's summertime, more people spend more time outdoors. And so they do their own sort of natural version of social distancing. Because in wintertime, more people spend more time indoors, windows closed, or sharing air. And that's the perfect environment for viruses to spread. So one would anticipate that as countries which have had their summer and are now moving into their winter, there will be an increase in transmissions of all viruses, including potentially the new coronavirus, because it spreads through the air. And the more time we spend in close proximity indoors, the more likelihood there is for it to spread. That said, of course, we all know that winter means different things in different geographies. And winter time in Australia is quite different from winter time in the UK. So even though winter is coming, I strongly suspect that we won't see the same surge that we could potentially see in other countries which are much colder during their winter times. Well, the most likely path out of this for everybody is that we, in some way, make the entire population of the world immune. Now, there are two ways that can happen. The simple natural way, which would have happened historically, is that we all catch it. And once you've caught it, then you all develop immunity. And that means that the number of people in society who are susceptible at any one time is really low. It's not zero because we've got newborn babies coming along all the time. And we also don't think that the immunity you develop to coronaviruses lasts indefinitely. And the evidence we have for that is that if you look at other forms of human coronavirus that circulate, then when you catch those, within about a year, the immune response you've made to them has dwindled. So we suspect, we don't know, but we suspect the same thing might happen with this new coronavirus. That's one possibility. The other possibility for making everyone immune is that we come up with a vaccine. Now, this is an uncertainty. We don't know which of the 100 plus projects around the world is going to deliver a vaccine, is going to deliver a vaccine that works, and is going to deliver a vaccine that works in a reasonable time frame. These are all unknowns. We've never been in this position, so we just have to wait and see. So for now, the main strategy is to use good old fashioned tried and tested public health measures to keep a lid on this until we're in a position where Either it has infected everyone and made us all immune, and we ideally don't want that because that will be a very long time because 90% plus of the world population probably are still susceptible, or until we get a vaccine. We're just going to have to wait and see. The other thing that's a bit more uncertain at the moment is if someone comes up with a magic pill. And there are some drugs that can change the course of the severe outcomes from the disease, but those drugs uh, don't actually stop you catching the disease. So there's still some uncertainty around that too. Well, the lessons that we can learn are that having good health infrastructure and good testing facilities really makes a difference because if you can screen people and you can screen them in a really fast, responsive, agile way, feed that information back to them and then do isolation of appropriate cases and their contacts, you have got a chance to keep a lid on this. Now, Australia's performed really very well on that front. Australia is one of the outliers in terms of having the ability to, to deliver testing at scale very promptly. And that's part of the reason, I think, why Australia's had a low case burden so far. Uh, countries like the UK can learn a lot from Australia's testing approach. Well, you've got to avoid, like the plague, people who've got this plague. Unfortunately, the only source of this is another person who's got it. And that's the rub, because the thing we've learned that I think has really been very surprising to people right across the medical spectrum is when we first went into this, we thought people who've got this new coronavirus, they've got symptoms and we can spot them because this dramatic thing that's killing enormous numbers of people, that must make people really unwell. So we look for the people with symptoms that will tell us who to avoid, who to worry about, who to admit to hospital, etc. Actually, as we've learned more about this, we've realized that a significant proportion, and we don't know exactly what proportion, but we think it's a significant one, have no symptoms whatsoever. And this is why it's such a headache, because you can't spot these people. And all of the tracking and tracing is all being done on the basis of who's got symptoms. So we're missing potentially, and this is a speculation on my part, but potentially half of the cases 
if we just use symptoms to find people? Because many people, even if they do have symptoms, have very trivial symptoms that they just dismiss as of no consequence and they go business as usual. And that's when it passes on the most. And the thing is, it doesn't know who it's, who it's being spread to. The virus doesn't care who it spreads to. And amongst the people it spreads to from an asymptomatic person will be a number of people who might develop symptoms and might develop very severe disease. So it's a really tricky one. And that's why the testing, screening, tracking and tracing and, and other app driven ways of public health measures effectively of controlling this is so important. Well, air travel has recommenced en masse to an extent. Uh, we've seen EasyJet, one transport line, opening again for business here in the UK just this last week. They didn't remove every other row of seats. They didn't leave every other seat empty, which initially in this people suggested that in order to observe social distancing, that would be necessary. What they did ask all the passengers to do was to wear a face mask the benefits of face masks are, we think, relatively limited, but they do protect other people from you if you're overtly symptomatic or shedding virus. They also cancelled all the in-flight services. So don't get on board their flights if you're hungry, was the bottom line. But at the moment, I think it's a suck it and see thing. I, I guess they'll try it. They'll see what happens. They'll see how the passengers tolerate it. Because quite frankly, I've sat in board meetings this week wearing a face mask for an hour and I found it pretty intolerable trying to, to put up with, with sitting there with something over my face making me feel claustrophobic for an hour. I'm not sure how people are going to put up with several hours of flight with nothing to eat and drink, no one to talk to, and I'm feeling pretty much cooped up. I'm not sure how, how popular that's going to be. In the long term, though, I think once, once we've dealt with this, and I think we will deal with this, then I think we will get air travel back the way it used to be. Although many people are saying they'd rather it doesn't go back to how it used to be because in certain parts of the aeroplane and on certain routes, it's not very nice. In terms of what will cause second waves, it, it is inevitable that we will see subsequent resurgence of this virus. And that's because it hasn't gone away the population remain fully susceptible to it. It is very infectious and it is everywhere, all over the world, there are cases. And as Melinda Gates from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, I think very accurately uh, a few weeks ago, if COVID is anywhere, COVID is everywhere. And what she's getting at is that until we clean up the entire world, there's no point in just brushing the dirt out of our own backyard into the street because the wind will blow it straight back in again. So we have to help everybody to solve this. It's a global problem, it needs a global solution. In terms of what will cause those resurgences, it will be that we get complacent and we relax the measures that have defended us against this too soon. At the moment, the reason the virus has gone away is because the lockdown measures in countries all over the world have been very effective. We've broken the chain of transmission. The virus is finding it much harder to spread from one person to another because people are staying away from each other, they're staying at home, they're working from home, etc. But if we go back to business as usual, everyone remains susceptible, and it will, sure as Arnold Schwarzenegger said, be back. And that's why we've got to be really cautious. And until we have a vaccine, until we have wide-scale immunity, we're going to have to have some kind of measures in place to stop it doing that. If we went back to business as usual and ignored all of the other measures that we had adopted hitherto and just gave the virus free reign, then we would see peaks like we saw when all this began. But we're not going to do that. No economy that spent money on the scale that uh, first world economies have. I mean, in the UK, we think we're probably going to, by the end of this year, have spent maybe a trillion pounds sorting this out. No one's going to throw that away and say, let's just go back to how we were, because there would be sure as eggs is eggs, a second peak, and it would potentially be worse than the first one. So what we're probably going to see is not so much a wave as a series of ripples. We're going to see little localised outbreaks in various places, which are pounced on fairly promptly by testing and tracing and isolation, quarantine of cases, and that will curtail those spreads. So it won't go away. But what we will see are these ripples. And I think we're seeing a, a sort of similar phenomenon in some of the countries that have previously got a lid on this and then seen resurgences. For instance, a, a very good example right now, Beijing. 
in the middle of Beijing, there are now 11 districts closed as we speak because one of the largest markets in the world, employing 10,000 members of staff, had an outbreak and immediately declared 100 cases. Now, the long incubation period with this means that uh, those 100 cases didn't catch it yesterday. They caught it potentially two weeks ago. So what they're hoping is that by shutting 11 neighbourhoods, they'll have stopped it spreading any farther afield. But I guess time is going to tell. But they have detected it. They have pounced on it. And I think that's going to be the way it's going to go. Lots of screening, keeping an eye on where cases are cropping up and then jumping on cases when there are mini outbreaks in various geographies and potentially even locking down those geographies to gain control in those local areas, but allowing really business to go on as usual in the rest of a country or territory.